Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to uh, tonight's Inside Code session. Um, my name is Marlene. I'm the admissions coordinator here at Code, and um, yeah, I always also like to jump in to uh, moderate those kind of events. And I'm super excited about um, tonight's talk. Um, we are joined by Sebastian, who is uh, an STS lecturer. And for everybody who um, is not familiar with our STS program at CODE, um, it actually stands for Science, Technology, and Society. And um, because at CODE, we believe that um, we should not just focus on you know, creating digital products and uh, playing around with tech. It's also super, super important to actually think about what kind of impact um, all that has on our society. We should keep um, you know, historical events in mind and we should um, also think about uh, certain political implications um, those digital products have. And um, yeah, that's why we have this um, program that every code student um, is uh, part of. And um, those, the, the modules that is offered by that program um, has have to be taken by every code student. And um, Sebastian will share a little bit more um, about uh, a specific topic today. Um, about the computing power and why you should not obey. So I'm giving it up to Sebastian and you guys can just uh, share your questions uh, in the chat also during the talk. And then um, afterwards we will have some time to address your questions and um, yeah, we can, we can have a little casual chat about everything. So uh, take it away, Sebastian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Malin, for this nice introduction. Thank you all for joining and taking some time to listen to me today. Um, for, for, first of all, I'm happy to answer all your questions about our STS program and uh, what it is here for and what you need to do and uh, how, how, uh, so to say, how it uh, plays into your studies at Code later. So if you want to have a more casual chat about that, uh, just be patient for the discussion. Right, right now, uh, um, I, I want to come to my talk that Malin so nicely announced. Uh, for which I chose the title Computing Power and why um, you should not obey. And um, you, you probably have already realized that little word game because usually people expect something else with computing power. You, you think about super big, super powerful computers and can do a lot of things. But um, I want to talk about why there's much more in this concept of power uh, when we think about computers and um, especially also when we think about technology in general. And um, I would say technology has a lot of things to do with expectations. And uh, that is also why um, uh, I assume many of you who joined this talk today uh, simply expect that I start sharing my screen now. So I prepared a lot of slides and I will, I will show you all my slides I have and I will click you through. And uh, just, that is an expectation I want to destroy. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't, do not want to share my screen, but I still have prepared a few slides to let you know what technology is all about. And my first slide <clears throat> is an interesting thesis. That's my starting point of my talk. And I hope you can read it. If not, you have to switch to speaker view. Um, if, if you want to read it, it says technology is not just a tool. Um, because, because that is an observation or an assumption that many people have when they think about technology. So, uh, and, I, and I think for that, we also have to be aware of and we have to know what is a tool or what do we usually mean by tool? Um, so, so usually a tool is something like this, like a hammer or something like this, a screwdriver. And what can you do with the tool? You, you can do, so to say, you can, you can fulfill a certain task. Like a hammer, I usually use it if I, if I want to put a nail into my wall, but I could also use it for, I don't know, uh, what, whatever things uh, that come up to your mind. Like if, if you want to flood the chat, you, you, you can think of what, what other things you could do with a hammer if you want to. Um, um, and usually when people uh, ask themselves the question, yeah, is a hammer something good or is it something bad? They say, yeah, it's just a tool. It depends on what you use it for, right? So I, I, could, I could use it to, to put some fascinating things on my wall I should have nailed my slides there instead of, uh, of using silo tape, but uh, then my landlord would probably uh, kick me out at some point. 
Um, but but uh, I, I could use it to build something great, but I could also, I don't know, uh, cause violence to people or to hurt someone with a hammer. Similar with a screwdriver. And uh, so you, you could do all kinds of things. You, you could build a weapon with a screwdriver, but you could also use uh, um, um, it, um, I don't know, to, to build something really helpful um, in order to save people's lives. Yes, and you can definitely use it to annoy your neighbors, which is also what I could do now when using a hammer. Another reason for not using a hammer right now. That is usually how people see technology. And usually that whole debate about ethics of technology is full of this assumption that, that technology is just like any tool. You could use it for good causes, you could use it for bad causes, especially when, when people discuss AI and the ethics of AI, which is also my main uh, focus point of the talk today, but also in my research and also in my teaching. Um, people think you could just use it uh, for, for good things or could use it for bad things. And um, so to say the starting point for my talk is, um, no, technology is not just a tool. And if you ask me what STS is all about, or what, what, what is your one takeaway message from studying uh, three years of code in our STS program, then it is, it is a sentence. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure a few of my students are also here, so I think they hear the sentence over and over again. So I repeat this quite often. But uh, for all of you who don't study with me regularly, um, yeah, technology is not just a tool. But I think I should also. Um, yeah, hi, Jonathan. Yeah, I think you heard, you heard me talking about that quite a lot already. Um, so um, I should explain what I mean by that, I assume. Like, how is technology not just a tool? Or how is technology, and you could put it in more academic terms or in more abstract terms, how is technology not neutral from, a, from, a, from an ethical point of view? By that, I simply mean technology creates expectations. It, it changes how we live together, sets new goals. It influences, so to say, how our whole society is organized and how our society works and, and interacts with each other. So what, one thing, again, just a very simple thing from the beginning, I'm not using slides. I'm not sharing my screen here, which is in a way maybe destroying some expectations. Today, like an academic talk, you're supposed to prepare a big set of screens, um, um, a, a big set of slides, and you need to share your screen, and, and people want, want to see uh, what you're thinking about. People expect nice cat pictures on your slides. So I, so I even prepared one for you. <coughs> so in order to make sure that people pay attention, I need to have a cat picture on my slide. Um, and so on and so on. If, if I don't follow this expectations created by technology, I'm somehow, how should I say, an outsider or somehow weird. So, um, or I, you, so you, you could leave, you could leave this talk today and remember, yeah, what did I learn today? I remember that code has this one lecturer who, who doesn't like to use slides, who rather speaks um, uh, with putting some cat pictures on his wall. So there's one. So to say, yes, it's just, it's just it's one disruptive message to take away. Um, but, uh, and here's exactly that point. Give, giving a, giving a, an academic talk 50 years ago in a real life setting, I and mean, uh, we could also talk about how online setups and online scenarios change our teaching and learning and discussing together. Um, so, so but, but listening to a talk 50 years ago and the lecture doesn't show you any slides, it was just normal. Like there was nothing special about it because I don't know, PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever hasn't been invented <laughs> back then. But doing it now, it is kind of, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, Jesse already writes disruptive or it's at least somehow special or unique and um, sim similar thing applies to, I don't know, so social media not using social media. Uh, it, it's not a, like you can say everybody has a choice. It's your choice whether you use social media or not, or whether you use Facebook or whether you use Instagram or, or, or LinkedIn. Like a lot of colleagues are always shocked when I tell them that I do not use um, more or less any of those. Um, um, 
And by that, uh, it means also I miss out on a lot of networking, connections, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, in, in a sense, it's not a free choice, which, but, but you, but if you don't use it, you, you sort of say you're not fulfilling society's expectations and it's different not using social media today from not using social media 50 years ago. And, um, and this sort of say creates um, certain expectations, it creates our how we live, how we interact with each other. And I think that is very important. That is one take away message that it's not simply neutral and you could use the internet, but you could also just let it go. Like, um, I think I'm doing quite well with uh, staying away from most social media, but uh, I would have a really hard time working as a philosopher of technology at code uh, and, and at the same time re refusing to use the internet. That would be, I think, uh, yeah, probably I, I wouldn't keep my job very long if I, if I would tell, um, tell our, um, our founders that I, from now on want to stop using the internet. Um, so um, I'm also not saying that it's something problematic with using the internet, but um, I just want to show you it's it's not just a neutral thing, but but um, our society changes and people have to adjust to it and have to have to I use a mean word already have to obey to a certain extent. And, and, and typical another interesting thing when we think about technology as a neutral thing is. Um, yeah, we could use it, but we could also let it go, so to say. But just also often underestimates the idea that technology creates goals that humanity didn't even have before a certain technology was invented. So with the invention of new technologies, new goals are created. Very, very simple argument. Before, before the plane was invented, nobody had the desire to fly over the Atlantic Ocean within eight hours. It's just a, it's just a desire or a wish or a goal for human beings that was created with the creation of this technology. And, and nowadays, um, you will also, like, imagine you are afraid of flying, you will have a hard time being an academic, being invited to conferences. Um, uh, 100 years ago, it, it was just, uh, it, nobody would have minded. So, um, one, one key message is technology is never just neutral. It's never just a tool, but technology changes how we interact. It changes how we perceive the world, also very important. Already, I don't know, simply my classes change how I perceive the world in, in a very literal sense, because without my classes, I'm almost blind. I would need to go as narrow to the cam or to the screen to see anything. So, um, but, but with the help of technology, and also my glasses are technology, um, I'm able to see you in, in your full beauty and to, to interact with you, so, um, which allows me to participate. So all this idea that technology is not neutral is not negative or not necessarily negative, but it's just something to be aware of when we think about technology in its broader sense. And that is sort of a, Probably the key message I want you to take out of this talk, but I obviously I prepared some more slides. Um, I want to quickly walk you through because obviously my thesis doesn't stop here. It just starts, just, just the starting point. Second slide. Yeah. Still readable. It says, Controlling the technology is the same as controlling the humans that rely on this technology. And I, and I think that is very, very crucial. So Im imagine that you desperately need a hammer because you want to put up a nice picture at your, at, at your apartment, but I'm the one who owns all hammers out there, or I have a patent on all hammers, and, and you, you rely on me. So I can charge you whatever price I want because there is no competitor out there. But, but somehow, I don't know, it is a social norm or it is, so to say, it is just fashionable or you want to impress your friends by, by showing um, your nice picture at your wall, but you don't have a hammer and also no silo tape because they already have the, have the monopoly on silo tape. Um, then you will have a problem, so to say, oh, you rely on me and I, and I have power over you. 
maybe maybe with a hammer it's not so obvious, but with um, with other things, um, um, uh, when we think about more digital technologies, um, this becomes more drastic. So just social media, the, the companies who own social media have a lot of power over how we use those technology. Google has a lot of power over what we find when we use Google or um, um, simply by controlling or by determining or influencing what news we read and what, uh, um, uh, so to say, what products we can find and um, what music we can we, we can listen to and so on and so on. So um, also not saying that this um, actually is not a criticism yet, um, but it's at least something to be aware of that owning a technology or controlling the technology also has power over people rely on this technology or who use this technology and um, and this is especially true and now I finally start talking about AI but maybe some of you would have expected from joining was also happy we, we can also chat later on for hours or, or days or months about AI always happy to do that um, but um, especially with AI um, technology there are a few companies who who work on that in its full detail, so to say, or who develop AI frameworks, de develop AI libraries, and a lot of other companies rely on that. And it's always good to be aware of that there are power structures involved there or power processes. Also, where power suddenly also plays a role um, is with a lot of power structures and power processes we have in our everyday society. Like when people make decisions, it's probably the most obvious example nowadays. So you, you, have, you have a lot of decision making processes that will be substituted by um, algorithms making that decision for human beings. So whether you get a loan in a bank or whether you, whether you will find a job or maybe whether you will find a place at Code University. No, we, we, have, we have a human uh, uh, admissions committee. Um, but, uh, but yeah. There are universities that completely automize that, and there will be algorithms determining whether you will land a place to study or not. And, and those decisions always involve certain power structures because there are people who make this decision or institutions, and, and they have power over you when you, when you need you know, a place to study, a place to live, um, money to buy a, a new car or a new house or, or whatever. And um, a lot of those power processes are currently automatized or so to say will be computerized. And that's so to say my, my next slide that power processes that are computable will be computerized. So, so um, and, and I, th I think that's just a trend we currently face in our society. And it, it will, will become more and more obvious and, um, and more and more widespread. So um, uh, probably many of you have heard about the Chinese social credit system. So, so in China, um, if they invent this a credit system, or they have invented or have built this credit system determining um, w whether you are allowed to board a plane or to board a, a, a long distance train, uh, depending on your social behavior. And every citizen receives a, a score, and there's an algorithm calculating the score. Um, but you also have, well, like in, in Berlin, wh whoever lives in Berlin or wants to move to Berlin, if you want to look for an apartment, you, you usually have to provide your so-called Schufa score. Like it's a, it's a kind of like a credit score you get from from um, from an association that is somewhat connected to your bank accounts. And um, depending on your Schufa score, you will be lucky or not lucky when looking for a flat or or landing a loan. So you, you so, so you have a lot of those processes that are computerized. So com so people trust computers when making those decisions, and. Um, um, humans in a way lose control, but that so to say important decisions over the fate of human beings will be made by computers or will be made by algorithms, will be made by machines, which uh, so to say second slide, uh, which gives the people or the, the companies in this case who, who own or who control those algorithms, a lot of power that, um, that that we more or less are forced to obey, especially given 
the idea that technology is not just a tool. So just think about something like the, your credit score, like the, the Schufa score I just mentioned or that you have in many other countries. So obviously you can refuse um, getting a score like, uh, and you can refuse showing your landlord your, your Schufa score, like you have every legal right to do that. But the consequence simply is um, then you won't get a flat. So um, it's, it's not that you, uh, it's not a decision whether you want to use it or not. It's more a decision either you use it or you won't get this apartment. And um, so uh, slide one, technology is not just a tool you could use or not. Technology is something that you have to use in order to participate in our society. And, um, um, and there are a lot of power structures involved. And that is what I in the end call computing power here. But you could, uh, like, if you're into word games, you could easily say, uh, the higher computing power in the, I don't know, the tactical sense, the more power will be computerized, or the more uh, power, power structures and power processes will be done by computers. Or the more, the more powerful computers are, <laughs> the, the more power they will execute over us. Um, so probably I should have put a slide for that as well, but my wall is not uh, that big. Um, I only have a small apartment here. Um, <clears throat> but I have two more slides I want to show you. Yeah. Sorry, no, I'm just reading in the chat. Oh yeah, we, we can discuss the Shufa thing later. Um, but um, ex ex exactly, Jonathan, that's exactly the, the problem of um, something like the Shufa score or any kind of credit scores. Um, they're, they're also, I don't know, in, in, in in the US, for example, there are even um, judges who are substituted by algorithms. So whether you will, uh, will be allowed to leave jail um, on probation or not um, is currently calculated by an algorithm determining uh, whether you're allowed to leave a jail or whether you need to stay in, stay in jail. So even in such so to say, severe um, environments, um, uh, human, human decision makers will be replaced. Um, that, I don't know, there are all the universities creating the students, are like creating student papers uh, being substituted by algorithms. I'm always wondering if I should do that as well for my essays. I never, I never tried it out, but probably I should. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay, this, yeah, chat, oh, chat is super distracting actually while giving a talk, <laughs> which, which, which is also probably one of those reasons how technology influences our perception of the world. Like we are, we are forced to multitask all the time. There's always this information overload and, and our, our head, head, head explodes all the time. Yeah, no, you could continue writing. I just need to be better off ignoring you uh, and exercising my personal power, not, not obey to your, um, uh, to, to your wish to, to enter the chat. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> it becomes even more severe. This slide says, computing power, it challenges our understanding of human nature. And um, so we, we need to understand, or like one big question of humanity has always been, who are we or what is a human being and, um, and who do we want to become? And this question certainly um, is affected by the rise of technology or of digital technology. But by the way, it, it, was, it was always part like, although I assume the invention of the hammer changed the human nature or the invention of the wheel um, is, uh, is certainly influenced who we are as human beings. But maybe with digital technology, it becomes more and more severe. Um, and, um, and again, this has a lot of um, things to do with those power processes, so to say. Um, like how we interact, so to say, how human relations work uh, drastically changed with the introduction of social media. So pe people prefer social media over real face-to-face -face communication. Uh, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure who of you is happy that we have this kind of like Zoom setup uh, instead of like a real life um, conversation. 
Um, but on the other hand, it's, it also opens maybe up the opportunities that we could have a conversation at all, which we otherwise couldn't have. So it could even turn this into a positive argument. But, um, but it completely changes our expectations, like what we expect from each other. And here AI suddenly plays a crucial role and certain interpretations of AI technology that, um, I don't know, um, um, that, that we could connect our brains to computers, that we upload our minds to a cloud, uh, all those things that are discussed, which by the way are far from reality, in my opinion, also happy to discuss that later. Um, like that, that whole idea of so-called transhumanism or post-humanism that sort of say, with the help of technology, human change into something else, and, um, and um, th that you implement um, some kind of like sensors or some other kind of like interfaces to your body and, and somehow connect and melt with technology and uh, we develop into a different kind of species with the help of computer technology. Um, but also more, I don't know, maybe more current developments in terms of social robots that, um, um, uh, for example, in, in old people's homes that you, that you substitute um, the human caretaker with a robot or with a machine taking care of the elderly, or um, um, love robots that you can fall in love with a machine um, and, and have a relationship or could marry your own robot or whatever. And it's this kind of question, this kind of technology changes who we are and, and, it, and, it, and it changes our very understanding of, um, of human nature, of social relationships, because uh, it, um, like usually in, like in, in philosophy or like in, in tradition, um, traditional cultural studies, uh, uh, a human relationship is usually defined as a, um, as a relationship of, of mutual acknowledgement, that you acknowledge each other, or of mutual respect, that you respect each other. But obviously, a computer cannot respect you back, at least not at the current stage of development. So, so the idea that you are in love with a robot either is an illusion or we need a, a new concept of love that currently doesn't exist, but, but both heavily affect who we are and how we want to understand ourselves and how we see ourselves. And, um, and, and, and I think that is a very, very crucial point uh, I want you to make aware of. And, it's more for sparking discussions than for ending it. And um, I could go on and on, but I'm also watching the time and I don't want to miss out on discussion. But I also don't want to um, um, to end on, a, on this kind of like sad note. Or this, like many philosophers and always end with this kind of like traumatic thing. And, and yes, and, and everything is lost and everything is all about power. And, and, uh, and we, we are, so to say, hopelessly submitted towards tech companies and, and other institutions and we just need to obey and I don't want to end on this note because I think we, we can do better that is let us say that is already part of my title why you should not obey because at least to a certain extent it is your own choice whether you obey or not and um, and this so to say is a maybe like an empowering plea for being aware of those changes, for understanding technology and for understand how technology works. Um, so in, obviously it's not so easy. We cannot, we cannot uh, say certain parts of technology where we have to obey whether we want or not. So, uh, so um, sometimes I would wish not to use any social media at all or to, to shut off emails or just to focus on, on I don't know, on writing a book, but it's obviously not always possible. But uh, so I have to obey to a certain extent, but, but there are still choices we have and we, we can make. And, um, and for that, I would say education plays a huge role. Um, um, uh, namely, education is about empowering people to be aware of what goes on and, um, and to, um, to give people back control over um, technology. Uh, so, because if, if you look at this slide, ha, that's, that's a positive thing. If you put all the slides at the wall, I easily point to them. Um, controlling technology is being in control over the humans that rely on this technology. So, what we definitely need is, uh, or what we need to uh, 
bring back people into control over technology and uh, bring back human into control um, over what technology is doing to us. And I think education is one of the, I don't know, key components or key steps or key messages to take out, out of this, um, how we could um, bring humans back into control. And um, th that's why in the end, uh, um, we have a choice whether we want to obey or not. And uh, in the end, it's a personal choice. That's, um, um, my, my, fir my first headline was in why we should not obey. Um, but then I thought, no, that's, that's not true. It's a personal choice. Everybody needs to uh, decide for themselves to what extent or to what degree you want to obey to technology or, and, and whether you want it or not. And that's why I switch it to why you should not obey. So it's just a plea to, to think about what technology is doing to us, what current AI technology is doing to us. And I'm happy to hear all your questions and to answer all your questions and to engage in the discussion. And I also would like, yeah, I, I need to read in the chat what I missed because I didn't pay attention anymore. But uh, maybe I will just end here. Thank you very much for listening to me. It's actually much nicer not to share my screen while talking because that's at least I see you to, to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, look, looking forward to your comments and, and also criticism. I'm, I'm always open for criticism. And um, if they or uh, what, what the hell have I come into? Uh, what the hell am I here for? Um, then please. Also let me know that I'm happy to uh, discuss that with you as well. Thanks. <laughs>